I'm Adam Okada from Beyond Clean, and I'd like to express my gratitude for you choosing to spend your Friday with the speakers and myself. You are 100% making our day, and for that, we thank you. The title of today's conference is Flex, Exploring the Intersection of Quality, Education, and Equipment. And don't forget that we this is part one of two, so you actually will have a second opportunity to see more of these presentations on August 27th in conjunction with CDSBD. Uh, it's been a great day filled with enlightening dialogue from our subject matter experts, and our next speaker is here to keep this day of education rolling. Sunil Mandaba is the founder and CEO of Mobile Aspects, a company leading the way in safety solutions and technologies for endo, OR, and other procedural areas in hospitals and surgery centers. Sunil and his company currently own 17 patents with more pending in the area of safety and efficiency solutions for healthcare facilities. He has conducted leading research with MIT, Harvard, Mass General Hospital, and the National Institutes of Health. Sunil is dedicated to connecting hospitals with the critical data and resources needed to improve patient safety. Today, Sunil is going to identify and describe the current regulatory requirements for documenting the use and cleaning of flexible endoscopes. He will also answer the question, why is the Joint Commission focusing on flexible endoscope use and cleaning documentation during their regulatory surveys? So get ready, the what's, why's, and how's of all things regulatory surveys will finally be answered. Without any further ado, let's welcome in Sunil. Thank you, Adam. Uh, I appreciate the uh, uh, wonderful introduction. And uh, I wanna thank the Beyond Clean team uh, for inviting me to speak uh, to this uh, a very important uh, set of sessions. Um, I know speaking with a lot of uh, hospitals and healthcare facilities. Um, there's just not a lot of great detailed information or, uh, about this, or on the flip side, it, there's too much information. It's too hard to discern um, what what is the really important information that that, that uh, uh, team members, healthcare providers uh, need to have. And I'd like to thank all of you for, for joining and uh, spending uh, some time with me and, and uh, hearing me kind of uh, give my, you know, information um, uh, here about everything. Uh, so um, uh, my name is Sunil Mandava. I'm the founder of uh, Mobile Aspects. Um, Adam gave a great introduction there. I uh, I want to talk with you about um, uh, endoscope cleaning and documentation, the latest on uh, the regulations, uh, the scrutiny, why there's so much uh, scrutiny. That's important to know. I know all of you are having to deal with it on a daily basis, but understanding why the scrutiny is there also helps you to succeed um, when uh, the surveyors uh, come in um, to your facilities. And I wish they were, you know, trying to uh, give all of you a, a hand up and and help you through it. And, and some do. I don't I don't want to um, say that they don't. Um, but they really are on guard. They're they're um, really focused on patient safety. Um, but man, I mean, they they are really looking for you to be at at, at your best. So how to succeed um, with this uh, highly uh, scrutinizing regulatory environment that um, uh, endo GI labs and and other folks that are using flexible endoscopes are under today. So my agenda for today is I'll give you a little bit of an overview. Then as Adam kind of touched on, um, you know, why is there such scrutiny? I'll kind of walk you through that a little bit. Again, I believe it is really important to know. Um, some of you may know it, but you know, there, there are some different factors in there that you know, cause a lot of um, detailed uh, 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 things that they look at during, during their walkthroughs and surveys. Then we'll talk about you know, what the regulations are and you know, what creates a lot of complications. Uh, there's scrutiny, but then there's a lot of things that create complications, so we'll talk about that a little bit. Those are things that you all are going through on a daily basis, maybe how to deal with some of those things a little bit. Um, I am with hospitals a lot during their surveys, before, during, and after uh, their surveys. We also send out polls and uh, uh, surveys to uh, hospitals uh, to get their feedback and information. We know when they're going through a survey. Um, that's, uh, that's information that you know, we know pretty well. So they, they give us a lot of feedback um, on their surveys um, also. Um, some of the other uh, 
challenges that uh, all of you are kind of going through right now. And then I do want to talk about hope. There is hope out there. Um, there are tools available out there. Uh, one of the big things, I, I work a lot with uh, executives and physician leaders. All of these executives are focused on burnout right now, uh, staff burnout right now. There are tools available out there to help you succeed. I promise you, your executives, your physician leaders, they want to help you uh, succeed. Um, you just have to find the right tool. You have to find a way to really talk with them about it. Um, and then a lot of times they're getting through because they, they do want you to succeed. We'll talk a little bit about what else we're seeing coming down the pipe. I talk with a lot of luminaries. I talk with the Joint Commission uh, and other groups also. You know, what else is uh, coming down the pipe? And then, you know, we'll close and leave it open for, for questions. So Adam went through my background uh, a little bit uh, already. Um, but, um, you know, we, we, I founded the company about 20 years ago. We, for the past 20 years, I've just been in hospital operating rooms, uh, GI labs, endo labs, uh, cath labs, electrophysiology. I work a lot in trauma and ED also, um, but really focused on what are the top things that, that they're concerned about, their regulatory compliance, patient safety, um, and efficiency. Uh, we've worked with hundreds of hospitals across the country, large luminary sites like a Mass General or University of Pennsylvania, um, small hospitals, community hospitals, um, uh, surgery centers. So we've seen the gamut. We know what it's like at all the different uh, facilities. Um, we have 17 patents. I'm a, I'm a biomedical uh, engineer. Um, an electrical engineer, so I have a lot of, we have a lot of patents in our organization. We really tried to apply this radio frequency identification uh, to help drive a lot of uh, documentation, which is what you know Joint Commission is uh, looking for. And we have different applications of that. And so through those applications, we've really had a lot of discussions with hospitals and gotten a lot of their input um, that I'll, I'll um, share with you uh, today. So a little bit of a, you know, overview. Um, you all know Joint Commission, uh, the FDA um, uh, uh, are, are really focused on hospitals and surgery centers and anywhere flexible endoscopes are used, you guys are really under, a micro, under the microscope. Um, I just couldn't resist that uh, little pun there when I was putting this together, but it's true. Um, you guys are really under the microscope right now. The amount of scrutiny that you have they're not just walking in one day and then just taking a look. They're walking in Monday and they're taking a look at your storage. They're walking in Tuesday and they're taking a look at your reprocessing area. They're walking in again Wednesday and looking at your reprocessing area again. And then they're closing um, by, you know, sitting down with you and really going through the, uh, the reprocessing steps. I mean, they're really spending a lot of time uh, in these areas. Um, what I'm hoping to, to get across to you today is a survey is like an audit. It's like anything else. You don't want to give them, um, like on my shirt, you don't, you don't want a little string hanging out where they can just pull on that thread. You want to just make it seem like when they walk in on day one that, wow, you know what? There's nothing really here to see. That's what we've really helped hospitals do and just reduce that stress level um, that, that comes across when they come in. And really, at the end of the day, it's about patient safety. Um, that's what is really driving all of this um, uh, and the regulators to uh, increase uh, their scrutiny. It isn't your fault at all. You all didn't do anything wrong. Um, but these regulators have made it your responsibility uh, to fix the issue, um, to fix patient, um, the documentation of scopes and are they being reprocessed correctly? Is the staff trained? you know, all of these types of things. Um, all of our uh, polls and forums working directly with these uh, hospitals, they are just telling us they're spending a lot of time in these areas. And one of the biggest pieces of feedback that we're getting right now is the surveyors are now asking for electronic documentation. So before, it used to be okay that they'd come in and ask you and they'd give you, you know, a few hours or till the next day um, to come back with a combination of all your different written reports and logs of um, whatever they requested. Now they just want that to be all in one report 
and they want it to be electronic. This is one of the big things that they are really recommending and pushing. Um, and then I think you're going to see over the next two to three years, they're going to start, if it's not written in their requirements, they're really going to push it that way. So that's one way that you can really reduce the stress level is by having uh, and going beyond spreadsheets, going beyond um, uh, uh, Microsoft Excel uh, or whatever spreadsheet you might use, uh, but getting really a complete electronic system. We're seeing when that happens, uh, our uh, hospitals that are, are, are replying back in our surveys, they're saying when they have an electronic system, the, um, the scrutiny by the surveyor tends to come down because that's something the surveyor will trust. And those tools are available. You have to look for them. You have to review them, you know, compare the different vendors that are out there, um, uh, and then go and talk to your executives, your physician leaders. They want to give you the tools, but they want you to uh, requirements. Your hospital executives, they know in order to run the hospital, they have to meet and exceed uh, regulatory. So they will invest. You just have to learn how to um, grab all the information and present it to them. And I, I have a couple tips uh, for that. So let's take a step back. Why in the world in the first place um, are uh, the regulators, um, and it's Joint Commission, it's DNV, it's the State Departments uh, of Public Health, um, also uh, all the different uh, regulatory agencies why are they so focused on um, uh, on uh, uh, the cleaning and the reprocessing of flexible endoscopes? Well, in the aughts, I think as they were called, the early 2000s, um, a lot of reports started coming out in newspapers. I mean, they still had physical newspapers uh, at the time, uh, started coming out about reports of hep B, hep C, different neuroviruses, et cetera, being passed through flexible uh, endoscopes. And then it, it grew and grew and grew and then, and then became this big media attention to it. And then once Joint Commission saw that, they started scrutinizing it uh, more heavily too. And I think one of the things that really caused the dominoes to finally fall or, or maybe it was the final straw was that um, the VAs started exhibiting you know, some of these problems also. They didn't have a worse or a better problem than the rest of the hospitals out there. It's just that you know, they are servicing some of the most important you know, uh, patients and vulnerable patients out there, our, our incredible, wonderful veterans. Um, and so once they started getting in the news also, that's really when Joint Commission uh, really started honing in on this area. Then there were a few other things that started to um, make the situation uh, even uh, more difficult. The design of the scopes uh, started to become more and more complex. I'll talk about that here in a minute. And it just became an extremely narrow safety margin. That's Joint Commission's word wording. Uh, it's a very narrow safety margin uh, uh, I play tennis a lot and, you know, we, I always, we always talk about the sweet spot on the tennis racket. Yeah. I can, uh, if I hit the edge of the tennis racket or I hit the frame, it could go in, but probably not. But if I hit the sweet spot of the tennis racket, I'm going to get a nice stroke. It's going to land where I want, um, all of that type of stuff. The problem with this process is there's not a big sweet spot. Um, the safety margin is very narrow. And so that's why the regulators are like, you must fall, you must have your processes documented, you must follow them to a T, and you must have proof that you followed them uh, to a T. Another uh, thing that adds to the complexity is not only a, is the design of the scopes uh, uh, complex, each of the manufacturers have widely varying IFUs um, for how they want you to clean the scope. So the training of staff is really difficult. And then um, uh, retaining that staff is really difficult. Training them is really difficult. And then now the pandemic has just made it times 10. Uh, every hospital executive we're talking to is really focused on burnout, turnover, trying to get the staff back. This is just exacerbated uh, the problem. So there's just a huge amount of scrutiny um, in this area. 
then at the same time, uh, you know, it started to become a perfect storm, if you will, because not only did joint commissions start to put their um, uh, more attention to this area, endoscope usage started to rise and rise very quickly. In the late uh, 1900s, early 2000s, there was still a lot of, you know, cracking open the chest to do procedures and those types of things. Now, everything is done minimally invasively, right? Everything. It's, it's been an incredible benefit to all of our patients. Um, they, the, the, their uh, mortality rate is so much lower. They have to spend very little time in the hospital, and their quality of life is so much better um, after uh, these minimally invasive surgeries um, because of all the great technology around scopes and some of the new implants and things that uh, came out and uh, new techniques, et cetera. Um, but at the same time, this dramatically started to increase the usage uh, of scopes. Scopes are used a lot in minimally invasive uh, surgery. Um, it's, it's also easier to get biopsies. It's easier to do the surgery. It's, it's easier to do so many things um, so the scope use, it started to rise dramatically at the same time. That just made it so much harder for all of you. Probably your hospitals gave you the same amount of resources, but increased, you know, the volume. Then the superbug came out. Uh, they called it the superbug, you know, at the time. Um, uh, we hear all these crazy words with climate change and, you know, things like that. Um, all these new terms that we're hearing. Well, superbug uh, was one of the first ones was used for the CRE superbug uh, that came out and really uh, was in this uh, duodenoscope, um, uh, affected this duodenoscope. Uh, usage. So that then started to happen and increased scrutiny also. So, uh, and then we talked about how manufacturers, they started to release new equipment. GI physicians love them. I mean, the, the quality of the image is incredible, but the design is so complex. I worked really closely with Penn uh, around this uh, in, in Philadelphia. Uh, and their operating room team, their uh, GI and endo team. And that was one of the big complaints that they had. They went back to the manufacturers and they said, guys, stop blaming us. Stop blaming the hospitals. Stop blaming the providers. Um, you guys have made this design ridiculously complex. It makes it really hard for us to clean the scopes and train our staff and those types of things. I think all of those uh, scope manufacturers have done a great job. They are really working hard on those uh, updated designs, disposable parts, uh, things like that. So they're coming out with great solutions to help all of you um, also. But at the time, that was a really big difficulty uh, back then too. Um, so that that added you know, to all of it. And then reprocessing, I really like this wording that came out from the Joint Commission. It is a highly cognitive process. Um, sometimes we think, um, oh, it's the reprocessing area. Um, you know, it, it's just one or two steps. It's not a big deal. No, if you've been there, I mean, all of you have been there, but all of us know it's in, it, it requires so much memory to remember every single step for all the different type of scopes. Um, uh, and then, th then maybe the process changes from year to year, you know, et cetera. It just becomes really easy to omit a step or do a step that you used to do it the old way rather than the new way. It's very uh, taxing, very taxing. Um, and okay, on Monday morning when you're fresh, okay, that's probably relatively easy to do. But by Thursday afternoon, it's now Friday afternoon here, Eastern time, sun is shining here. You know, I'm tired. You're probably all tired from, you know, these presentations all day. That's when uh, these cognitively taxing processes can start to manifest into um, uh, mistakes. We're not setting up the team uh, for success. They're being set up for failure. That's where a system, you know, can really, you know, can really help with that. But that's that's part of it, you know, also. Um, and then the variation for these different uh, scopes that were coming out. Not everybody is a, I'm, I'm gonna you know, say this, not everybody is just an Olympus shop or a Fuji shop or a Pentax shop, especially the larger hospitals, they kind of have, have to have a mix of the different types of scopes and that really makes it, it's not Southwest, you know, one type of plane. 
um, where any pilot can go and fly any one of the planes because they're all the same. There's huge variation uh, there. So this really became the perfect storm, um, but it all comes from a place of patient safety. That's where the scrutiny really uh, came from. So then you all live that and you all see it, but it's important to know like, why are they scrutinizing this so much? These are the reasons why this, this scrutiny just increased so much over the last decade, um, I would say. Um, so who is doing the scrutinizing? Of course, it's the, F, you know, the Joint Commission. Of course, that's where you know, we, we all know it, it starts there. Just remember, the intent is good. It's all about patient safety. That's where everything is coming from. But we all know when things sort of um, come downhill, if you will, you're downstream of the intent. And so the way it's manifested sometimes can be really difficult on you and your staffs um, uh, to implement all of the different things that they're looking for. And they just keep adding and adding and adding to what they're looking for uh, every single time. So there's the Joint Commission, and we've talked about them a lot, and I'll talk about them a little bit more. There's definitely... Um, uh, DNV, the State Departments of Health, but really it's the partnership of Joint Commission and FDA, the FDA that really led the way. Um, the FDA, the way they the way they got involved is they started to say um, about uh, seven, six to seven years ago, a huge priority of theirs just overall is um, infections in healthcare. Um, uh, hospital acquired infections. It's a gigantic priority, still is a gigantic priority for them today. So when they saw this and they saw that there's exposure to infections um, through these flexible endoscopes, if they're not cleaned properly, um, if, if a step is missed, uh, et cetera, um, this became a priority to the FDA also. Then the Joint Commission and the FDA actually partnered together um, and this this made it not go up times two. This made the scrutiny go up like um, exponentially, um, not just, you know, um, not just in a linear fashion, but uh, exponentially. Once they got together and they started to compare notes and they started to do meetings together, et cetera, um, this really increased the scrutiny even higher. But again, I mean, they're trying to keep us safe. They're trying to keep our patients safe. Um, they also pulled in uh, leading hospitals, clinical team members. And again, this just became the perfect storm uh, for you know, what you all are dealing with uh, today. So um, the, the reprocessing process and cleaning, it is an extremely complicated process. Um, uh, it is not just um, sticking a scope uh, into, you know, we, we joke here and call it, it's like a fancy washing machine. These, these amazing HLD unit reprocessing units that are, uh, out there. Um, it, it is from the point you remove it out of your storage. You have to know everything about it. Actually, even within the storage, you have to know everything about it. Cause you even need to know when it hits your hang time, seven, 14, uh, uh, five, seven, 14, 30 days, depending on what you set that at, at your, you know, facility, it's really demanding because you have to track it from there into the procedure room, the, the soak in the procedure room, the pre then when it, now you have to know, um, I heard this was a big topic of discussion in the last session, uh, or one of the earlier sessions that um, you have to know when the pre-cleaning, when the soak started, when the pre-cleaning started, that's absolutely true. Um, and you don't want that to be uh, done by some manual you know, means. You wanna know when's the end of the procedure and you wanna be able to document when did it get into the, um, uh, in, into, uh, into the soak. Um, you gotta know that information um, and be able to document it there. If you're doing this manually, if you're asking your team members to remember all of these uh, steps and the number of steps are increasing, um, it just is, as the as Joint Commission said, it is just an extremely cognitively demanding process with a number of tasks that can be easily uh, omitted. Um, and 
are are your processes standardized? That's the other thing. Do you have you know different types of reprocessors in different areas of the hospital? Uh, are different people trained different ways? You know all of these types of things. Um, standardization is another big thing that um, uh, Joint Commission and the regulators are looking for. Do you have the same setup everywhere? That's a key to success. They know, they, they, they want you to interpret the standard however you want to interpret it. That's fine. They know you all are very learned in your area. They want you to get the information, document whatever the standard is, and ensure it's the same standard across the board. That increases quality and that begins to actually reduce then uh, if you increase standardization, that reduces the cognitive load and burden um, on memory. So today it's a very complicated uh, process. Um, there's a lot of different instructions for use. Some steps are manual, some steps are automated. These amazing reprocessing uh, reprocessors that are out there, um, very automated, but the, typically the steps before and the steps afterward are uh, unautomated, they're manual, and they're just as important as the, um, the pre-cleaning is just as important as the reprocessor uh, itself. Different reprocessors have different procedures. Do I do, I do the solution test uh, prior to when I stick the scope in? That, that's the way one works. Another one of the agents works that you put the strip test in afterward and then you send it off to your labs and it comes back 30 days later and or, or a week or two later and all of this type of stuff. Wow, it's, it's just so much to remember. Um, uh, for your for your team members, but Joint Commission expects for you to remember it. They expect for you to document it um, also. Um, and each hospital interprets these uh, IFUs, these requirements differently. So if you, if you have a team member that comes in, they could be very experienced and then they come in from another hospital, um, they may do it differently. And then they have to relearn uh, you know, how you guys do it you know, at your facility. So um, there's a lot of variation uh, that's there. So we work very closely with our hospitals. We're there uh, uh, before, during, and after uh, their joint commission visits. We send out surveys to them and they send it, you know, they send the information back to us. Um, a big thing, you all know a lot of the regulations. A big thing that I wanted to get across to you is what's the real, what is, you know, tell me what's really happening um, during these, during these surveys. What are they really uh, focusing on? Um, so I, I, what I tried to do is I tried to gather some of that uh, data um, and and put together the ones that we were seeing the most uh, um, since you know about six months before the pandemic and now on-site surveys have started again um, you know uh, now that we're hopefully in a good in a pretty good you know place um, you know what we're seeing over the last uh, uh, three years you know in the last three year joint commission cycle so they're spending huge amounts of time in the GI and the endo suite. Before they might have spent one day, now they're spending three of the four days uh, in the endo suite. They come in Monday um, and they point out a particular scope and they say, show me all the patients that that scope went through. And if you pass, great and survive, awesome. And everybody, you know, the, the wipe wipes the beads of sweat off their head, off their forehead. Then lo and behold, they come in again on Tuesday. And they, they come into the reprocessing area and they point out a reprocessor and say, show me all the scopes that went through that reprocessor in the last uh, 90 days. Oh, my gosh, another new test, you know, that you have. They're spending multiple days looking at these areas. So that's it. That's a real thing that we're seeing um, that they are spending two days in uh, TWO, two days in the reprocessing area, really honing in on the reprocessing uh, area and process. They really want to know, what's your process? Is it documented? How are you training your staff? Um, sh you know, show me your documentation. Uh, they're looking at, do you have one door? Do you have two doors? They want you to have that clean, dirty door, if you will, and, and clean door on the other side. These are these are the real things that, that they are looking at. Um, they uh, they want us to move from manual documentation 
to an electronic system. We heard that this was one of the biggest things that we heard uh, from all of our uh, all of our respondents is some sort of version of this. They want us to get away from spreadsheets. They want us to get away from the ticker tapes. They want us to get away from uh, logs. They want us to have an electronic system. And the next one there, they want us to have data for the whole round trip of the scope. So even though they're focused on the reprocessing area, they want us to have really good logs and reports for the whole round trip storage, patient procedure, when did it get into the soak, when did it get to the reprocessing room, uh, did we do all the steps in reprocessing, um, uh, the reprocessing itself, and then uh, finally back into storage, that whole round trip. That's a big thing that, that they're asking for. If it leaves your department, where did it go? Do you know which department it went to? If it went from GI to the ORs, there's a lot of borrowing. Do you know, you know what happened uh, there? Do you have that documented? Um, I kind of talked about the last point there a little bit. They're just coming in. They're pointing at a scope and saying, show me all the patients that you used that on in the last 90 days. Then they come in another day and say, point out a particular reprocessor and say, um, uh, show me all the um, – scopes that went through that reprocessor in the last 90 days. This was um, something that we're starting to hear a little bit more of now too, is if you have the extra tall scopes, um, your current storage may make it that um, uh, you can't fit those extra tall scopes uh, in there. Um, just a lot of the you know current storage just wasn't designed for that. So people are uh, S-curving uh, the scope. Well, the way Joint Commission looks at it, and there's research about it and those types of things, is uh, don't S-curve the scope. You know, the liquid that's from the reprocessor, um, you try to dry it all off, but it can't, it's, it's hard to be 100% you know, dried off of there. It will get caught in the curves there. Um, and so then any spores or any, you know, anything that's left on there, it, it, gives, it, it gives it an environment to grow back. Um, so they really don't want the S curving uh, to happen, even if that's the only way to fit into your current storage uh, units um, also. Um, there's a lot of focus on the training of the staff. Do you know, do you document who was trained, who was not trained? Do you document uh, that they were kept up to date on an annual basis or however often you've documented that you said you were gonna do that? Do you have updated training? Uh, those types of things. Um, that's become really important uh, to the Joint Commission. Uh, we have a, a, a couple of the respondents that said, uh, or more than a few of the respondents that said, many hospitals don't do this, but some do. They double wash some of their scopes. Okay, well, which ones do you double wash and which ones don't you double wash? That's fine if you want to do that, is what Joint Commission says. Well, however you interpret it, we trust you. But document it, whatever your process is, make sure you follow the process, and then document that you did the double washing of the scope. How are you documenting that? Um, how are you making sure your team remembers, oh, well, 90% of our scopes we don't double wash, but these ones we do double wash. That's an easy mistake uh, to make. If they're in a hurry, they got to pick up their kids at soccer practice, I'd make that mistake every day of the week. I mean, that's, that's really hard to remember. Um, you know, when the scopes are, you know, coming in and you're in a hurry in this, again, cognitively taxing uh, process. Um, again, the two doors, they want you to have one for the use scopes that are coming in. And then uh, after reprocess, the exit door, the clean door for the reprocessed uh, scope. And then, uh, again, I heard this uh, came up in uh, previous sessions. Um, we got a lot of respondents saying, hey, we were asked to know uh, the end of the case to the soak, to the pre-soak and the soak. Uh, time. Um, I think most hospitals are saying 45 minutes, some are saying an hour, uh, depending on their IFUs and their research, but the uh, Joint Commission is really asking, okay, what did you set that at? How do you know that? And show me how you know that. That's a big thing that they're asking for. Um, pretty much all the hospitals we talked to agreed that having an electronic system really reduced the scrutiny, the temperature, the just the, you know, um, 
just the, the extreme focus that the Joint Commission had. As soon as they saw that, that electronic system, there was still scrutiny, but they just started to back off, you know, a little bit because they're like, ah, you know, appearances mean a lot, you know, still to, to any audit or survey in life. Appearances mean a lot. And it's like, this looks like a good process. It probably is a good process. Now, they're still going to poke and check and, you know, make sure they're thorough people. We appreciate that they are. Um, but you can really reduce the chances um, that, you know, that type of thing will happen by having an electronic system and everything is complete, you know, uh, and organized. Um, Joint Commission, everybody is focusing on the process and documentation. Um, of course, the results are the most important thing, but everybody knows, and Joint Commission really focuses on this, and, and I'm an engineer, so I appreciate this a lot. Usually, a really good process and documentation leads to good results when they're not there for the next three years. So that's why they focus so heavily on, you know, what is your process and what's your documentation? They know in the end that's truly what's going to lead to um, uh, a, a high level of patient safety and, and quality. Okay. So um, then there's the business challenges. I mean, there's Joint Commission, there's FDA. That's one side. Then on the flip side, you have, you're in a hospital or you're in a, a healthcare facility or you're a provider. There's the real challenges of running that business, the financial challenges. The pandemic just, you know, blew up, you know, so many things um, and changed so many things with regards to, you know, both of these. Do you have the right type of scopes, the right model of scopes? Do you have too many of the wrong type of scopes and not enough of the right type of scopes? Um, these are the other business and financial challenges um, that are really happening. Uh, do you know what types of scopes you should have? Or is it just, well, this is just sort of what we've bought over the years and this is what we have and we're dealing with it. Remember, one of the things is this, if you have the wrong types of scopes, Joint Commission actually kind of cares about this too because if you have the wrong types of scopes, they're not being used. If you have a seven-day hang time, uh, that you've set at your hospital, then you have to remember to pull a ton of scopes down every seven days and you have to document that. So we didn't get a lot of respondents saying that Joint Commission is literally asking that question, but there was a lot of tangents that kind of led to us saying, hey, you know, you should care about this uh, from a uh, regulatory point of view and from a business uh, point of view and running your, you know, running your department. There's operational challenges. ORs are, are uh, sorry if I'm throwing anyone here who's you know in the ORs or perioperative uh, areas under the bus, but you know operating rooms are borrowing a lot from uh, GI and endo, or maybe a different hospital uh, within the same health network uh, with these very expensive ERCP and other type of scopes. Maybe they're borrowing and they have a limited number of scopes within a health network. That's a gigantic operational challenge and something that Joint Commission is gonna ask for you to document. How do you know? Okay, someone else is borrowing it. How do you know where it went, if it came back, You know, all those types of things. They will dig into that if they see that that's one of the things that's happening. How are you tracking damage scopes that you sent out for repair? How are you tracking loaner scopes that come into your facility, uh, their cost? Um, and if you have multiple departments within the hospital that are using scopes, are you standardized? If you have multiple facilities like different hospitals, if you're a health network and surgery centers, are you standardized in your process? Those are the things that they're, re they're, they're, they're starting to ask right now, but you all know, if you've been doing this for a while, you all know what they asked you, th just started to ask you three years ago or six years ago. Those are the things that are eventually, they're gonna really hone in on on their next visit three years from now or six years from now. Um, for those of you that don't know, Joint Commission comes in every three years like clockwork. They are right on schedule um, like clockwork. And then staff burnout. Um, this is a big thing that uh, executives and physician leaders at all hospitals that we're talking to, I work with a lot of executives. They are really focused on staff burnout right now. As Pre-pandemic, they were talking about it. Post uh, I guess we're post-pandemic or whatever the appropriate word is. Uh, Pre-pandemic, they were talking about it. Post-pandemic, they're focused on staff burnout. So is your process highly cognitive? 
Is it is it manual or do you have a system that kind of guides them through, you know, the steps to set them up for uh, success? Um, uh, and does it give them the alerts at the appropriate time so they don't have to remember or look at a tag on a scope that it hit the seven day alert or seven day hang time or five day or 14 day uh, hang time? There is hope out there. Solutions are available. Um, there are pro process, best practice, and then there are software and hardware solutions out there if you want to invest in those types of things. Surveyors are asking for an electronic process. They are becoming more and more aware that these solutions are out there. So they are really starting to recommend, hey, you have to have high fidelity and knowledge about everything that happened to your scope. And they really want to see that electronically and really going beyond that Excel spreadsheet that, you know, a lot of hospitals are using um, uh, and, and currently considering electronic. But let's take a step back. Um, process and best practice. So first question you want to just ask yourself is just, hey, basically, do you have a documented process? Is it published? Is it easy to find for all your team members? Um, Joint Commission says any documented process is better than no process. They at least want to start there. Do you review your process annually? Is that something that you have like on a scheduled basis every January or every July or every October or, you know, whenever it is like clockwork, you are pulling it up, you are having meetings with your team and you're saying, does this need to be updated? Maybe it's a small update, usually not a gigantic overhaul. If you do it just in a small, bit, small way repeatedly on an annual basis, wow, Joint Commission will love you. Uh, for that. If you show them, yep, we do this every year. Look at it. Here's our documentation and we meet every October. They will, they, this is the thing where the image matters as much as, you know, the result in terms of, you know, these surveyors, you will really get across, you will really get across a great, um, uh, a great image, you know, to them. And that will reduce the scrutiny. Do you have all your information in one place? Or when they ask you something, are you jumping around from place to place to place? Are you pulling up one log here, uh, a manual log over there, and then a spreadsheet over here? Are you pulling up three spreadsheets and then trying to combine it? They don't like that. They want to see one source, one source of truth. That is, that, that, that is really easy. So an easy test is if I asked you for the round trip record, take one scope, and ask you for the round trip record of that one scope that you know you just used yesterday. Do you have to go to multiple places to get that information? Um, or is it just in one place, you pull up one report and boom, there's all the information. It's a very simple test. It'll be eye-opening if you do that. Do you have set training for your staff? Or do they come in and they just kind of learn by you know doing? Um, that set training is a big thing. You know That's just a great best practice. Um, and again, do you review the train, not just the process, but do you review, review the training at least annually to ensure it matches updated processes? Okay. So that's the process and the best practice. And you can do all of that manually, and that's, that's great. And, and if you're not there, joint commission, you will go up two notches if you start um, making those processes. Then if you want to really go to the top notch and really what uh, the surveyors and different regulatory agencies are really starting to ask for is get an electronic solution. Move away from these piecemeal solutions. They break easily. They're hard to, you know, put together. You know, some hospitals say, well, we have our reprocessor does documentation. Even joint commissions, that's great, you know, for after the case. Um, but what about before the case? What about the time from uh, the procedure to soak to putting it into the reprocessor. How are you documenting the whole round trip of the scope? Rather than having individual points, they're really looking for that one electronic, you know, solution for you to have. Um, there are multiple vendors, you know, out there. I mean, we're one. There are other great ones out there. Um, they just want you to have that single source of truth and set yourself uh, and your team up for success. And your executives are. Um, you know, if they want you to succeed. So, you know, I would say go start talking with them about it, pull them into the discussion early and say, we need something. You'll go out and start to do some research. Um, the more you involve them earlier in that process, the more they'll start to take ownership 
rather than you do all this work and then at the very end, you know, you hear a no, right? Um, what you really want to do is involve them from day one bef as you're really starting the process. They'll take ownership and they'll kind of, uh, by being part of it along the whole way, you're more likely to get a yes at the end. So more scrutiny coming down the pike. Uh, some of the things that we're seeing, all, we work with a lot of, um, again, another poor pun here. We work with a lot of luminary hospitals, big, gigantic academic hospitals. They're all saying, we got uh, We got to do channel drying, drying the lumen of the scope in addition to the outside of the scope. It's already preferred by ASGE, uh, Society for Gastroenterology. Um, and they like they're buying, you know, systems and cabinets and things like that. They're like, you know what? We know Joint Commission is probably going to make this a requirement. So they're going ahead and buying the cabinets with, you know, channel drying uh, built into it. And, you know, one tip here in best practice is if you're a high volume shop, um, avoid lengthy dry times. I mean, it, you can't wait 30 to 45 minutes for a scope, you know, to dry before the next case. There are solutions with 10 minutes, you know, that are best in class. I mean, we, our engineers were able to uh, uh, dry, you know, scopes very effectively in 10 minutes. There are other solutions out there. I mean, that's that's you're a high volume shop. You need to move through, you know, really, really quickly. Centralized storage, command and control. They're starting to see. I already saw in a Joint Commission webinar that uh, Joint Commission is saying we realize if you guys are standard, this makes maintenance. Um, uh, easier and standardization increases uh, quality. And then because of the pandemic, we're starting to see a lot of people asking about UV lighting too. Um, it's not here today, but it's a potential new challenge um, that we see. So uh, in summary, remember just to begin with, I know all of you are dealing with this on a daily basis and it really makes your job you know, very difficult but everybody's intent is really good. They're coming from a place of patient safety at the end of the day. Um, uh, so j just remember that, keep, you know, keep that in mind uh, every day, all the time. Joint Commission and FDA, they've really partnered here that uh, along with all the other factors that we talked about, those factors led to them partnering together. This, this created a huge amount of scrutiny um, uh, during these Joint Commission, DNV and other uh, visits. They're really focused on documentation. Do you know your process? Is it documented? Do you document the entire round trip? Is it in multiple pieces? Is it you know in multiple places and you have to pull it together? Is it electronic yet? You know those are the types of things you want to start thinking about. You know right now there is a huge focus on the reprocessing area. Um, it's just a highly cognitive you know process right now. Is your team set up to succeed? or are they set up to fail? I mean, these are really hard jobs to do. You know, whatever you can do, involve your physician leaders and executive staff. Physician leaders care also, uh, you know, about this. Um, they want your, you know, team to succeed uh, a lot. Um, ideally, Joint Commission is looking for that full round trip solution. They're starting to really ask for, is it electronic or not? Um, we're hearing from surveyors, eh, you should take a look into, you know, something like that. There's more regulations coming down the pipe. Just start to be prepared about that. Um, uh, and uh, um, uh, if you can, you know, work with the hospital, work with scope manufacturers, find a great, you know, solution. Uh, there are solution providers like ourselves and many others that can uh, provide you great solutions to, you know, help with this process and hopefully reduce the stress and um, uh, increase the quality. Uh, for you guys. So thank you so much for your time. Um, I'll turn it back over to Adam uh, for questions and uh, discussion. Oops. Sorry, Adam. I'm having trouble hearing you. There's that me on my end. Yeah, I'll hop in. Um, so, Neil, thank you. I really appreciate that. It was very informative, and I'm sure it's going to be a great asset to our audience. So really, really do appreciate all your insight on all this. It's a very important topic, and, um, 
you know, of course, anxiety producing for hospitals and facility, you know, hospital staff. And um, so we got some great questions for you. And I'll throw the first one out. Let's see. Should the auditor be someone from outside of the department, infection prevention or performance improvement? Uh, should or is. So, um, you know, is the auditor uh, someone from outside the department? Um, uh, usually I see um, uh, it is like infection prevention, uh, et cetera. Um, that is what we, you know, see a lot of the times. I believe it should be someone from both within the department um, and someone from uh, infection uh, prevention or infection control kind of working together. You can have multiple, you know, auditors on the same visit. And that actually leads to the, you know, best result um, in the end, I believe, for the for the hospital. Okay, great, great answer. Um, so I actually, this is a question on my side that I wanted to ask you, you know, because with all of the turnover in the industry right now, and the short the staff shortages and just the the anxiety levels. How would you re recommend prepping new employees for Jayco visits and just getting them, you know, dialed in to where they're just not as you know dealing with the anxiety level and they're you know they're prepping adequately and they're working with their team. So, yep, uh, great question. So couple things I would recommend um, or a few things I would recommend is um, first is is just giving them some basic education on what is joint commission. Joint commission is great uh, and they can be uh, interpreted or, you know, um, if, if, if people haven't gone through the process before, they're sort of seen as this entity that can be like really scary. So just sort of, you know, prepping them like, hey, here's who Joint Commission is. Here's what, you know, the audit is like, you know, here's what they do, you know, like like those types of things. And just kind of calmly walking them through, you know, the, the background of what Joint Commission is or whomever the, the survey or auditor is. I mean, there's also DNV and a couple other, you know, groups, um, you know, and then uh, what, uh, what the previous experiences have been at the hospital. There's so much knowledge there in every facility, so many people that have gone through uh, uh, these surveys at that particular hospital. Hey, what happened? How long were they here last time? What types of questions did they ask, uh, et cetera? And then one best practice I would highly recommend, um, a lot of uh, ho uh, best practice hospitals do is they will do an annual mock audit uh, internally. And you can do that you know, by yourself, um, maybe working with infection uh, prevention or infection control, depending on you know, what you call that in your hospital, um, working with them. They could be the auditor, or I'm, I'm not one of these agencies, so you know, I, this is, I have no uh, skin in the game, or hiring an outside firm that that's what they do. Um, that can really bring a lot of insights as well as improving your processes, it will get your team ready for, you know, game day uh, when, when it comes across uh, the next year or, or two years later. Yeah, that's a great answer. I, I actually worked at the hospital in uh, South Dakota that did a, a mock audit and they got their entire hospital ready for it. Uh, I think it was two or three weeks in advance and they passed with flying colors. So. Yeah, that's a great, great suggestion for sure. Um, next question. We have multiple manufacturers of scopes with different IFUs. We decided to reprocess all scopes to the scope with the higher standard unless contraindicated. Is this an acceptable practice? Yeah, I, I, I like the standardization. I'm an engineer. So, I, I mean, I like the standardization to the highest, um, you know, to the highest, uh, you know, standard uh, possible. Um, you know, I, I, I would still recommend that you really do your best to follow that specific manufacturer's um, IFU 
you know, certain manufacturers, they're okay with, I mean, intense reprocessing like ETO or, you know, not ETO, you know, things like that. And it's like, that might be the highest, that's like the really, really highest standard, you know, or, or one of them, but that could also damage the scope. So, um, you know, that's a very crude example, but that's why I would still try to do your best to follow that particular, as difficult it is, as it is, um, to try to follow that particular manufacturer's um, IFU. They've done the research. They know their product really well. Um, and, you know, when they make their recommendations, they know what's going to lead to the best performance and cleanliness, you know, for that uh, particular scope. That does mean you have to constantly train your staff. Um, and again, maybe put in a system that uh, alerts them proactively with the right, right guidance at the right time. Great, great answer. Um, another one here, what are your thoughts on incorporating single use endoscopes as they come to market er and are on par with reprocessing costs? So this is a popular topic and so yeah, it's a, another great question. Yeah, we see this. Uh, this is a very exciting, you know, area around um, uh, endoscopes. Uh, you know, we're just seeing that uh, the physicians uh, really love the quality of image that they're getting from their, um, you know, their very high cost scopes, but, you know, from their reusable, flexible uh, endoscopes. So I, I think that's really going to take a long time to change because, that is going to be a physician-led uh, change uh, if and when that occurs. It's not going to be administrative. Um, uh, it, it's really going to be a physician-led uh, change. So I, I still foresee that's going to be a, 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 a while away. But there are some really good applications, you know, narrow applications where uh, that can start to take over uh, a lot faster. But as a general, you know, moving as a general industry, it's going to it's going to take you know, a while to get there. I'd love for a day when, you know, everything is, um, might not be great for the environment. That's the only flip side of it. But um, I'd love for a day when it's like, hey, you use it once and, you know, you're done uh, with it. But um, it's going to take a while, I think, for us to get there. Yeah. And I also think, too, that it's probably, you know, right now it's not economically feasible. I think, you know, reprocessing at this point in time is probably, a little bit less, you know, of a hit on the budget. I mean, of course, you have to get the repairs handled and everything, but um, yeah. yeah, the the cost associated with just single use is is right now at least is probably detrimental. Yeah, we had one hospital who um, they showed us they did an internal study, extremely detailed. I mean, they broke it down to the amount of you know the the work hour for the person. Uh, the uh, wear and tear on the machine, the actual um, solution that goes, you know, into the reprocessor, putting on PPE, like they, you know, they really calculated it out, and it ended up being like, uh, oh, I, ha I have to go and look at the number, but it was in the range of forty-five to fifty-five dollars uh, per, you know, reprocess, I guess, cycle. Um, sounds expensive, but that's still relatively, you know, inexpensive. Um, uh, for the hospital to do. Right. Thank you. Um, well, I think we have time for one more question. So if you are high volume, then why do you bother, bother to dry the scope? If you use it within a couple hours and there's no real reason to dry it. Um, yeah, I'd like to hear you guys, yeah. your insight I, on that I, one. I, I think the, the reason uh, there is um, two, two things there. You, you just best practice. You do not want to take a still, even if it's just slightly wet scope inside and outside into a new procedure. That is just not, you know, uh, best practice to do that. Um, and then the second thing I would say is, you know, when we look at the overall process, we usually think about the, uh, okay, during the day you pull it, you use it, you know, those types of things. Well, these scopes are often left uh, overnight, over the weekend, you know, those types of things. So, and that occurs a lot. So you really want to make sure that the process is going to be, you're going to dry the scope, 
inside and out before you use it, you know, the next time. So I think it's the combination of those two things. Yep. Always best practice. And yeah, you need to have those scopes dry in my opinion. Um, yep. Clean well, means dry is what I learned from my orgo days back a long time ago. So, <laughs> yep, exactly. Um, well, Sunil, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for taking the time. We had a, a lot of engagement, a lot of attendees, which is awesome. And we really appreciate you once again being a part of this conference. I think there's going to be more to come on this. We've got a lot of information that needs to get out out there and as you said there may be too much information at times but we need the correct information so um you know really appreciate you once again and to to our audience um just to let you know we will be taking another 15 minute break and then hopping back in for the last couple of sessions and again if you have any other questions if you have if there are questions we did not answer sunil will get to them uh, we will send him them his way, and he's also got his contact info on his slide here. So thanks again, everybody, and we'll see you again shortly. Thank you, everyone.